Hi everyone. Um, I'm here at our host, the Downtown Proper Hotel. Thank you so much for allowing us to be in this space. It's a beautiful space. And I'm here with my guest, Shana Nice Dambrot, art critic extraordinaire from Los Angeles. And we are about to engage in what I think is going to be a very dynamic talk on public art from someone who I would consider an expert. <laughs> so welcome everyone. I'm gonna let everybody get settled in and um, yeah, and I'm gonna start off Shana, yes. who I've known for several years now. Um, I want you to tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, who is Shana? Who is Shana? Who is Shana? Who is um, <laughs> yeah, but well, now I have that little song from uh, Liam is stuck in my head. Anyway, uh, hello everyone, Carmen. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm excited um, in no small part because like you and I have been having a conversation about public art for years. And yeah. so I'm super excited to sort of let everyone kind of in on that now, what we've been kicking around. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm an art critic, um, author, curator, all those things that come with that. Uh, for the last six years, I've been the arts editor at the LA Weekly. Um, for anyone who hasn't heard, that ended on March 15th, but like, don't cry for me, Argentina. I'll be okay <laughs> for right now. I'm gonna go cover the Biennale for Flaunt, and I have some surprises up my sleeve for when I get home. Um, but uh, that is probably how you know me, and that is definitely how we know each other. Yeah as I was also the sort of like OG number one psycho fan of Luminex. <laughs> uh, not least because I too live here in downtown Los Angeles. And so what you did was like directly made my life better. You know what I mean? Like it, it, when I, we talk about the neighborhood and the community, well, that's my neighborhood. Yeah. And it was so incredible uh, to experience something, you know, coming, coming to us, uh, coming to us here and someone who bought it. So that's how we, we bonded basically over how awesome you are, so that works out. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, and now, now I'm here because I have all this free time, and I can't think of a better way to spend it than chatting with you. Well, I can't ever imagine you and your life with free time because it's always challenging to get uh, Shana's attention because she's constantly talking to artists, you know, going to exhibition openings, and now you have like travel plans to be going and, and covering different festivals and fairs around the world. So, and you're still writing for the Village Voice. Artillery and, and, and Vaughn, of course. And um, yeah, those are three remarkable, very different publications to each other. And that'll definitely keep me busy for a minute. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I have a couple of questions that I wanted to ask you to circle this back around because you're an art critic. It's an interesting vantage point, both for the audience who are artists and also different public art curators and other public art organizations or just, you know, um, people interested in public art as a topic. So it's a cool vantage point because as an art critic, you're covering all different types of art. So for me, I really want to understand what is your interest in, in public art? How does it relate to you as an art critic? Well, um, thanks for that. You know, it's, 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 there's sort of two simultaneous answers. I wish I could say them both at the same time. I have to pick one to start with. But for example, when we were getting sort of ready and you were like, you know, quick, what's your favorite, you know, public art in LA? And I said, Alison Starr's sculpture outside the Hall of Justice. That's kind of one, one of the things that I think public art magic is for, which is to kind of engage with and question and critique and celebrate and elevate, you know, the biggest values as a society of culture that we can agree upon. So for example, justice for all. But then to see an artist like Allison come in and interpret justice for all to, for example, question exactly what you mean when you say all, mm -hmm. given the reality of the history of this country, and how justice has not always been and arguably still remains not in fact e available and certainly not equally available to all. 
what does it mean for a contemporary African-American artist from a matriarchal legacy of artists engaged in a community in Los Angeles to be the one creating the vision of justice that will be a permanent sculpture mm -hmm. meant to last, you know, no time limit, generations mm -hmm. outside of this venerable hall. And sort of all of the things that that can mean and the way that she embodied all those things visually and those kind of meta narratives. And I think that kind of public art is A plus. Yeah, 10 out of 10, no notes. Yeah. And then I also think that public art like what Luminex does where or what you know the um the people of LA I'm saying the name wrong but um Projections LA where they do the portrait it's almost like the the Tate does the portrait of Britain that's mm -hmm. the images of all the and then we have a version of that in LA that's projected outside in Grand Park during the summer mm -hmm. and I think that that kind of free splashy theatrical temporary space and architecture activating project is uh, also super crucial because it does all those things but it, it focuses the mind like oh this is only for a night two nights a month mm -hmm. so i need to go and do this thing and have this experience with all these other people that are also here with me because it's temporary so we all have to be here now doing this you can't just kind of walk by and see the sculpture whenever and I think that stuff is super important as well. Um, and so public art for me is always both and in that sense, even though those, like to think of Luminex and the Statue of Justice as the same is, is a fun, you know, critical exercise. Well, but, and the, the combination maybe is the access. Yeah. Right, that there's no barrier to anybody being yes. able to have an interaction with those engagements and they do definitely have a totally different placement in terms of like the public art milieu but but um, equally they have you know metadata they're free with them. Exactly. they're outdoors mm -hmm. there's I mean when you say no barrier it's like people talk about barriers but it's like there's literally no barrier like That's you're right. just on the sidewalk yeah and it's there with you exactly yeah exactly, exactly that um so how does public art connect to your work? Like what out of, you know, as an art critic, like what are some of the pieces that you have critiqued or when you're talking to artists and interviewing them and they bring up like, you know, um, interest in public art or they have public art in their portfolio. Like can you talk a little bit about some of those connections that you Absolutely. Some of the most interesting of that kind of um, dynamic has, has happened in LA with regard to artists and uh, mural making. Mm -hmm. And so I've known plenty of, I've known a lot of artists who started out as street artists and mural makers yeah. who've wanted to have a conversation on canvas in a white box room. And then I've known just as many who've moved in the opposite direction, who are fine art painters and then have an opportunity to do a wall yeah. and start thinking about what that means and what they can accomplish beyond just like, oh, it's big, but like, oh, it's what's the history of this corner, this building, this community, like what, you know, like all, all the factors. And so it's been really fascinating to kind of watch that, be, that border become porous and basically evaporated to nothing <laughs> over the last couple of decades. And that's been really exciting because you see artists who have a whole, they know exactly what they're doing and who they are and what their paintings are about in a sort of more conventional, art setting mm -hmm. and then they're tasked with creating a piece of public art that is going to engage tens of thousands of street unknowable strangers or yeah. you know have it's a whole different world in some ways yeah and um well you must I, have yeah. seen that a lot in flavor pill especially like you know as that um publication yes. has been you know really avant-garde and had a big position in what I sort of like term as the street art revolution. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about like your time at, you know, Flavor Pill and during that moment? Flavor Pill was, like... was so fun, right? <laughs> it was so much fun. Um, you know, uh, the, when they spun off to LA, they needed somebody who 
could be an art, you know, who, who knew about art because they knew they wanted that to be um, front and central in the, the spread of what they covered. And the original uh, managing editor of LA is a fantastic guy, Matt Deal, who's more of a music writer. At yeah. that time, he was famous for um, Notorious COP, that hip hop cop oh, thing. Okay. And he came, like, he's genius. He still lives here in LA, but his mother's Carol Deal, the art critic. Uh -huh. And so he was brilliant because there was no learning. He was like, I did art, my mom, you know. So yeah. I had a really um, beautiful welcome into that community, even though it was not an art magazine or anything like that because the, the people that were there valued art writing and art coverage and they yeah. were like do your best um, and then later when I took over I brought that focus with me but it you know even from the very beginning they were so all about making sure that they included um, the avant-garde and the underground of what was going on in independent art in their sense of the cities uh, cultures where they were in New York LA, San Francisco, London, Chicago, and I think they did Miami after I left. Yeah, but, so, hugely influential. But they brought that. Absolutely. You know, that's kudos to them, to Mark and Sasha, who founded it, who really knew they that they wanted that. That's amazing. And that's that. Otherwise, somebody like me, with like my little art history degree, writing for Art Week and other things, wouldn't have necessarily been who you pick for like a city guy uh -huh. type editor. So uh -huh. it, that I. It can't be overstated how um, unique that was <laughs> to have being an art writer be what they were looking for. I, I later realized how what a unicorn that kind of actually was. So yeah, we love Flavor Pill forever. Yeah, I love I love Flavor Pill. Um, so tell me a little bit about we've sort of danced around this, but like your favorite type of public art. So we talked about like work that is permanent versus work that is more temporary and ephemeral. But when you're thinking about like the mediums of public art, like sculpture versus performance versus sound art, you know, there's great pieces that are going into LAX. We have a lot of opportunities in the city to, and I think that that, um, you know, we keep pushing boundaries of like what defines public art, what public art can be, what public art is. And in many ways, you know, movements in the 70s, you know, that we had in Los Angeles, <laughs> Um, with our amazing like Chicano artists and you know um, performance and fluxus art, you know really push the boundaries and we're kind of exploring that again. So I'd love to hear from you like what 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 turns you on? Well, like I love for example <laughs> you know little moments like um, you know the festivals that happen like the clock shop and Heidi Duffer things that happen in the State Historic Park in Chinatown not least, and the Kite Festival, and just all of that. Yeah. And not least because it's amazing and free and perfect, um, but also because, you know, it borders on that face of the building that was the women's building, and they were some, some of the practitioners of exactly what you just described, using mm -hmm. sort of any media performance included necessary to like get the, get the message out. And so there's this kind of history, of, and many kinds of histories in that, in that parcel of land, but I, I love those things because like, I would say the audiences are probably about half people who are like, ooh, site specific multimedia sound and dance in the park. Let's take the train. Let you know, let's go, and half people who just thought they were going to go for a walk with their dog <laughs> or a little jog or a picnic, yeah. and suddenly this is happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's for them too. Yeah, it's maybe more for them in some ways. Yeah, and I, I love that space activating, location activating, haphazard quality, the fact that the audience doesn't have to make one single decision that they're gonna go look at art today, mm -hmm. that the art's just gonna be in their path as mm -hmm. they go on their way to do whatever they were gonna do. Mm -hmm. That, I mean, I love the same thing about some of the, out at Desert X, like I get the drama of their remote projects, but for me, my heart is always with the ones that are kind of on the fringe. Mm -hmm. A, a lot on this side of the road that's not developed where you're driving to dinner mm -hmm. and suddenly what's that mm -hmm. you don't know what desert x is maybe mm -hmm. but it's there mm -hmm. you, you can't help it you're driving with your eyes open mm -hmm. and that to me is like that's where we start to breathe and grow and expand and you know 
we, we talk about outreach, but like, they, you know, it's completely passive. All they have to do is look where they're going. And suddenly they have experienced this art. Mm -hmm. And that I feel like is a really good source of more people caring about art is you, you get them when they weren't expecting it. So I have a wild question. I was asked this recently um, by someone and I found it to be like a really, I don't know, it, it kind of rocked me, but I'm gonna ask you. Okay, so, uh -oh. um, Shayna, yes. can art save the world? Ah, uh, 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 okay, yes. I think the short answer is yes. I think it's, you know, it's not like a direct A to B, but I think the path to yes runs through changing people's hearts and minds. And I really don't, I really don't mean that in a dismissive hearts and minds, like the dating army kind of way. I mean, your heart, like affect how you feel about mm -hmm. yourself mm -hmm. and your fellow humans in the world around you, emotion, heart and mind educate you, make new uncomfortable information palatable and give you a sense of what's going on so that you can take action if you want because honestly you should want to mm -hmm. and that is I think art does have the power to do those things mm -hmm. so I'm gonna go with yes yes okay good <laughs> <laughs> amazing we won um Okay, so from your opinion, what are the most unexplored opportunities for public art? Ah, uh, okay. Like what is our future in public art? Or what should our future look like for public art? Well, right now, I... Place us in your utopia. Yeah, my utopia. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that right now, the... I'm not an expert in policy, in how the DCA policies works, like how you get permission to do or build, or build something temporary versus permanent. I know that, I mean, I can imagine the, that there's, uh, you know, big B bureaucracy with that, I, I'm pretty sure. I have no proof, but I'm guessing. So I'm really interested in the things that people can do that are not like, gorilla, but sort of just like more nimble or, you know, th that would be able to engage less with bureaucracy and um, like expense mm -hmm. and teamsters and insurance and like, I'm very interested in just, you know, we talked a little bit, obviously Luminex is, you know, projection, but if you look at like the world of protests, right? And the protesters who are getting like a little handheld projector at Best Buy and standing on the sidewalk across the street from the Target, we're not going to say the name, property, and, you know, emblazoned with their slogans, there's no trespassing, there's no permitting, there's no uh, vandalism, there's no anything, there's no damage, there's no nothing. So technology is supporting... And I love protest. how that supports yeah. the pro protest mm -hmm. movements. And I can definitely see a world in which that could support um, a lot of engaged, you know, very nimble global public art too. Because like I've made a piece, well, I can email it. I can email my piece mm -hmm. to my friend in Amsterdam and then it can be projected there simultaneously. No plane tickets, no carbon footprint. Like, you know, those kinds of things that technology makes possible, I think, um, is, a, is just me, you know, I don't know, I don't think that's the whole future, but I'm really excited about that uh, sec, that sort of aspect. Because it takes the barrier down and it creates a level of authenticity that is like so pure in terms of like a one-to-one -one with the artist's voice and what And immediacy too, right? Because like you don't have to plan something that'll be done in 18 months if you're literally lucky. Yeah. You can just kind of go for it. And I love what, you know, the ways in which technology can support that kind of, you know, and then you're right in it in the moment. And again, you know, you're meeting people where they are and you're yeah. in the conversation, not yeah. commenting on it later because museums work years ahead and that stuff happens and it's amazing. And the scale of that is not something a person could do with what they got at Best Buy. So yeah. we need all of it. Yeah. But I think that's 
that's what I'm most excited about right now. Yeah, I can totally get on board with that. Yeah. So my final question um, is what advice, so yeah. from the lens of who you are, what you've seen, people that you've talked to, what advice would you give artists who are interested in creating public art? Um, I would say the single most important thing is to be extremely con conscious and um, intentional about the, his the history of the community that you're doing your piece in. Like, we, I live downtown, yes, these are a lot of empty, flat exterior buildings. But, of course, there's a little bit more to it than that. And if you're anywhere else, there's always more to it than that. And I like to see um, not treating, like, just because it's your, not your neighborhood doesn't mean it's a blank canvas, right? It's something. And so I think that stuff gets really interesting when there's, even a little bit of that sort of like research community conversation of like what are what has happened here why here yeah and maybe it is just that you love the building but the yeah, I don't know Google the architect like something <laughs> do you know what I mean like yeah. figure something yeah. more yeah. out um, because no city is an is a blank canvas well, it's and a that's history the, that's right and that's the opportunity yeah. of public art when you're doing something site specific you have to be intentional about the placement. So I was looking out the window here. Um, you can't see out the window, but we're in the South Park area of Los Angeles. And there was recently, you know, you can't see it from this vantage point, but I think from the other vantage point. Yeah, so we have an art critic here, and there was recently uh, the Ocean Wide Towers. That was so cool. Um, <laughs> with graffiti that a lot of you guys may have seen virally, and I want to get uh, Shana's this is my wild card yes. question. Yeah, yeah, perfect. <laughs> okay, art critic, what do you think about okay. that piece? First of all, <laughs> my heart is so full that they did that. I yeah. was so proud of every single one of them. I was like, you, because I mean, not for nothing, and this is gonna sound funny, but I really mean this, collaboration is hard. So the fact that that many of, of like that kind of, you know, bandito artist type managed to make a plan keep a secret, coordinate it. No, I don't, my understanding is no one or very few people got caught on the day, right? They just kind of like, you know, found, found them later. But like that would serve the surgical nature, the timing, the, and then the fact that it was not only just sort of like awesome on the merits, but that it immediately sparked the exact conversation we need to have about like, what is going to happen to all these abandoned buildings now that Jose Vizar is in jail? Question mark. Yeah. Okay. Like, what? Yeah. It's been a while. Yeah. So even the guards are bored. That's how long that's been abandoned. Yeah. So to my mind, it was nothing but an improvement. It sparked a much needed discourse, and I'm proud of all of them. Like, good job. Good job, kids. So you heard it from Shana, <laughs> everyone. <laughs> An amazing public art piece that is a temporary installation. Yeah. Oh, is it temporary though? It's still there. It's yeah, been like two months now, yeah. right? I yeah. mean, yeah. So I and I think it's an improvement. So yeah. it's yeah. much more interesting to look at than it was before. You can't. Yeah, you can't absolutely. Deny. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. We'll absolutely make sure that we uh, circle back and answer any questions that you have. I'm just not savvy enough on Instagram Live to be able to look for them. Um, you guys have been the best. I really appreciate this big audience that we've had here today, and thank you so oh, much for taking Carmen. your time. I am so excited to be here. It's really good to see you and all of you guys. Very good to see you too. Okay, we'll talk to you guys in a couple of weeks. Bye.